Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher, and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana, and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Hello, 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 hello. This is R.C. Blakes. This is R.C. Blakes, and I am so excited to be able to share with you again today. Uh, I want to deal with something that uh, is really a, um, it's a very common subject. In fact, about it, there was a stretch where I actually uh, kind of dove into an understanding of this issue and did quite a lot of content. Uh, on the subject. If, uh, if you've not seen my messages on this particular subject, go back and search them out. In fact, about it, uh, there's a book that I've written. Uh, Lisa's working on finishing the, um, the production of that so that we can release it. Uh, and it's dealing with understanding um, narcissistic abuse. And the title of my book is um, Me, My, Mine. Just the uh, the self-centered, selfish concepts of, of a narcissistic person. But I want to talk today about just kind of recognizing some basic red flags that um, you may potentially be dealing with a narcissist. Now, for, for you know, a lot of us, you know, it, it feels like overkill, you know, because I myself, though I've dealt with a lot of narcissists, I've never really been traumatically impacted by, you know, a narcissist, at least not to know it, should I say. I'm no therapist, right? But as far as I'm concerned, I've never been traumatically impacted by a narcissist, aggravated, irritated, frustrated, absolutely. But when I, when I, you know, when you deal with as many people as I deal with and you really get a chance to talk to and befriend and come into relationship with people who have been traumatically impacted by narcissistic personalities, you realize that it's really not just overkill. Like, like you, you see a lot of people, all they talk about is narcissistic abuse you know, uh, the trauma that comes behind a relationship or with a relationship with a narcissist. And for people who've not been, again, traumatically impacted by narcissists, it's like, you know, why do you keep talking about that? Well, you have to understand, um, number one, this is a very real situation. There are people who are so broken and the narcissist is broken um, that they lack the capacity to actually love others, to feel for others, um, to be concerned about others. They just kind of view people as um, a means to an end. Um, supply, you know, I need this, you possess this, so I'm going to use you for my supply. You know, and when they're done using you for supply, uh, they they can discard of you like anybody would, a, you know, a, a paper bag or what have you. And these people exist in the forms of biological children, so-called spouses, husbands or wives, parents, church members, uh, best friends co-workers and they do quite a lot of damage hurt people hurt people right they do quite a lot of damage to the people that uh, are in their path so I'm saying all of that so that you know if you're sitting there and you're like well I you know I've never felt all of that you you can at least have 
some empathy, put yourself in the other person's shoes and, and uh, have some compassion. Because I've learned quite a lot having to, having to deal with, a, a, I mean, just an army of people who have been almost utterly destroyed at the hands of narcissists. So it is real, it is, it is valid, the pain is valid, and a part of the person that has been abused and suffering from the trauma is, is being able to vent it, being able to talk about it, being able to hear other people talk about it so that they know that they're not crazy, they were never crazy, and that this is a very real thing. Because one of, I believe, the, the diabolical intentions of narcissistic people is to drive you absolutely nuts. Uh, I think the official term for it is gaslighting, gaslighting you, you know, just creating a scenario around your life that makes you feel like you are losing your absolute mind. So these conversations are important. And recently I talked about, you know, you know, a woman testing a man. But this conversation is not specifically to women. This is, you know, non-gender centric. It's not centered on male or female because both we have female narcissist, we have male narcissist. Now that's interesting that I said that because that brings me to something that I think needs to be said. Um, I think all of us have to truly do um, the internal work relative to where we are. You know what I mean? Because when you think about society and you think about our attractions to people, the male's attraction to the female, the female's attraction to, to the male, why is it, why does it seem that good men tend to choose Delilah or tend to choose Jezebel. It's like, it's like the really good guys end up with a Jezebel or a Delilah that destroys him, breaks him, and then takes a good man and actually turns him bad. Just, you know, he, some reason he's attracted to a toxic woman. And that's true. And then you, you look at the more obvious thing, and that is how Good women um, are attracted to toxic men. You know, you think about the way the world builds us. The world says, the world conditions the man to be attracted to um, the woman that uh, is the most uh, sexy. You know, the, the cheerleader type. No, you know, no shade towards cheerleaders, you know. But... I'm just trying to make a point. The woman that is uh, overtly sexual, you know, the woman that's the trophy, so to speak. And, you know, what does that mean? All of that stuff is superficial, tangible, physical, sensual stuff. That's the woman that the world says, OK, when you when you make it as a man, that's the woman you want. Nothing to do with her character really nothing to do even with her intellect. And so as men, we're kind of like drawn to these women that are superficial, all, you know, wrapping and no substance, style and no substance. And then we wake up and we try to figure out, well, why does she leave us? Why, why does she leave me when I lost my job or COVID hit and my business went down and my money wasn't the same and she was ghost. <sighs> you got to go back and you have to revisit what your standards are for a woman. Because I was talking, in fact, which is what um, stimulated my conversation with you today. I was talking with a young man yesterday uh, who's had two toxic women, one behind the other, and both of them were gold diggers. It, they were just there for the money. And once they got through using him for the money, um, 
you know, they were ghosts and they left him broken. And now he's trying to figure out, well, pastor, how do I break this soul tie? Well, you have to start. We have to go back to what part of you is so broken that makes a toxic person attractive to you. Now, when you flip that coin, the world says to the man, of course, you need a sexy, sexual, sensual woman. No, no character, you know, n nothing internal and, in, you know, and enduring, just tangible, superficial stuff that's not going to last long anyway. And then you wonder why you get your heart broken as, as a good man. Then you get angry and now you, you're mad with all women in the world because you went and chose uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? You mad with every woman in the world now. Now you you know you just you you like the 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 uh, the Avenger nerd now. You know dun, 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 dun. I'm gonna get back at all women, but it wasn't all women that broke you. It was the wrong women that you chose that broke you. When you flip that coin. The world says to the woman, "Well, you need a man with money." You know, and you know, I agree with that to a certain extent, but that can't be your base criteria. You need a man with money. He needs to be six feet tall. You know, he needs to be that nothing to do with the character, nothing to do with the internals of the man. And so you run your happy self out here and you choose a man. You turn guys down that don't have the money yet. Let me say it one more time. You turn guys down that don't have the money yet. Now you are attracted to him until you discovered he doesn't make money. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is not gonna work, I'm not attracted. No, no, the reality is you have been conditioned to be your own worst enemy with this thing you call your type. So my point is on both sides, if a man is sitting here and a man is saying, man, I'm just, you know, these narcissistic women are just, destroying my life or if a woman is sitting there and she's saying these narcissistic men are just destroying my life well it didn't start with the narcissist I mean you didn't just wake up and the narcissist was in your house somebody had to open the door somebody had to welcome them in so it doesn't start with the fact that you know this person is a narcissist they've destroyed my life it starts with what part of me has been so broken so as to be attracted to narcissistic individuals because that's where you know i think i really believe with all of my heart because of the way i was raised and you know the strong parenting i had and uh the self-esteem that was poured into me by my father and my mother. Um, though I made a lot of mistakes in my, my young life, I, I never really was susceptible to narcissistic women. In fact about it, I never even cared to be around narcissistic dudes. It just wasn't my thing. You know, I just, I didn't relate to it. And when I got around a woman that was like overbearing, uh, overly sexual, overtly sexual, sexually aggressive, it was always a turnoff because there was something in me that it just didn't resonate with. But that's, you know, that's a young man that's raised in a proper environment whose internals have been um, established or set by a wise, godly, loving father and mother. But most of us don't have that, right? So most of us are, are growing up and we become grown, but we still have these things that are deficient within us. And so when there's something that, when there's, um, when there's a deficiency in us that the parent should have provided, we usually try to fill that deficiency through relationships with the opposite sex. And so, you know, that's a, that's a rant I went on, but I, I just, I thought I needed to say it because you keep asking why, why do you, why do I keep running upon one narcissist after another? Um, you have to, you're at the base of that. You're the, you're the, uh, you, you're the common denominator. You know, you, you're present in all of these experiences, you. And, and I think you got to step out of your pain, step out of your, um, 
emotion and you have to objectively look at yourself and you have to ask yourself why this is where you know therapy comes in handy because a therapist a counselor what have you psych psychologist or what have you they help us to understand why we think the way we think and we get the outcomes we get because of the way we think if you don't know you're thinking that way and why you're thinking that way it's going to be very very difficult for you to ever change the behavior or the mindset that is constantly opening the door for all of this pain and shame to come into your life. If your testimony is, I've had one, two, three, four different narcissists, one behind the other, there's a problem somewhere within you. That's, that's all I was saying. Didn't mean to make it a 15 minute rant. But when we, when we look at, you know, the definition of narcissist, um, it's said that a narcissist is an extremely self-centered person who has an exaggerated sense of self-importance. It's uh, a manipulative individual with no sense of empathy. I know a narcissist. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I know a narcissist. I do. I do. I do. I do. And the thing that confuses us is when we can look at a person and we can say, you're a narcissist, and we yet love them. I know a narcissist and I love this narcissist. But you know what? I love myself, I love God, and I love me enough that I'm not going to allow my love for you to let you, to open the door to let you into my life to continue to wreak havoc. Not in my life, you're not. I love me too much to allow my love for you to let you do the damage that I know you can do in my life. And see, that's where the broken consciousness comes into play when you when you're struggling with broken consciousness as a man or a woman what is that you don't really know who you are you don't really know your value you don't know your worth you have you don't have boundaries in fact you don't have boundaries that you should have to protect you when, when you when you when you know who you are and you love yourself you can look at a person and say you know what i love you but i'm not going to have anything else to do with you i'm not now if I can help you in some way from a distance, I will. But we're not going to have any kind of a personal relationship because you don't have the capacity to love me like I deserve to be loved. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, let's see, the scholarly psychological study of narcissism is, is really fairly, it's, it's really a fairly young um, study around, you know, probably around a century. And it was in the, the 80s, I think it was, that uh, narcissistic personality disorder was officially listed. The 80s, as early as that. Uh, or as, you know, as late as that, should I say. And I say late because um, the disorder of narcissism has been around since the beginnings of man. You know, when you look at uh, the... Cain and Abel in the garden. What makes one brother kill another brother because the other brother is having success and he is not? The dude was, was a narcissist. The Bible demonstrates narcissism before even, you know, the creation of man. When you go back and you look at all of my videos, you'll see I go through all of this and I'm in those videos. I'm actually teaching it as I'm learning it. Lucifer, Satan, you know, I, I believe is the father of narcissism. I believe that. If you look in Isaiah, speaking of the devil, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, same person. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Here this dude is an angel, which I think is a relevant point to make here as I think about it. The, what I call, who I call the father of narcissist is actually an angel. So you cannot judge a person based on their appearances. You have to discern their hearts.
But you see here, you, you hear it in him. This, this dude is talking about, I'm going to be like the most high. I'm going to put my throne above his. And, and it's just me, my mind, me, my eye. You know, just all of these personal pronouns. So narcissism is the term used in psychology to describe a preoccupation with one's self. Um, it is a Greek term taken from the name of the mythological character Narcissus who fell in love with his own image and was doomed to die because he would not turn away from it. He looked down in the pond of some body of water and he saw his own image and he was captivated by his own image and all he could see was himself. Now, the narcissist, well, let me, let me read this. A narcissist is a person who displays a high level of selfishness, vanity, and pride. You know, like there are days I get on here and, you know, I have, I didn't get a lot of sleep. I have bags under my eyes. My beard is not groomed. I'm not dyed black and my hair is not cut, and my eyes are red, and I hit the button anyway, because I understand the value in not being as vain. Now, of course, your appearance and your presentation is important, but not to the extent that you, you look beyond purpose and the value you bring, because, you know, I got to wait till these puffs go down. No, no. I got to wait till I get a haircut. If I have to wait till I get a haircut, I'm going to get very little done. But when a person is narcissistic, they display high levels of selfishness, vanity, and pride. He or she sees everything from a how does this affect or benefit me perspective. For this person, empathy is impossible because they're... Only perspective is the one centered on them. In psychology, narcissism is seen as a broad spectrum of conditions ranging from normal to pathological. Now, um, the narcissist doesn't like his or her true self and has no limit on how much he or she would use others to psychologically compensate for their real shortcomings. There's a, there's a self-hatred within any person that is a narcissist. There's something about them that they hate and do not like, and they will use any and everyone else to subsidize the need to fill uh, those voids. Now, psychologist Stephen Johnson writes that the narcissist is someone who has buried his true self-expression in response to early injuries and replaced it with a highly developed compensatory false self. And this alternate persona to the real self often comes across as grandiose, above others, self-absorbed, and highly conceited in our highly individualistic and externally driven society, mild to severe forms of narcissism are not only pervasive, but often encouraged. You know, when you think about how we're raised as, as, as young men, we're raised to function narcissistically, even if we're not narcissists. The game is all about narcissistic strategies to position a woman where she may be managed uh, psychologically, you know, emotionally and physically or sexually. You know, that's the stuff we learn around the barbershop. It is, it is celebrated in a man to be, you know, somewhat narcissistic. Women love dudes that are narcissistic. Most women, when you talk about their type, the type that they're describing is really a narcissist. Now, the grandiose persona is really just the cover for the private pain of feeling inferior and worthless. That's what's going on in, inside of the soul of a narcissistic individual. 
you know, again, it, you know, he says it's on a broad spectrum, goes from mild to extreme. But now let me give you, let me give you these points. When, you, when you're thinking about, is this person I'm dealing with, um, am, I, am I embracing a narcissist here? You know, just meeting this person, um, because narcissists can initially be quite um, engaging, you know what I mean, and attractive, and, you know, they can really make you feel like they're the one. So you have to have, you have to have some kind of psychological system in place that you are discerning this person. You're trying the spirit, the spirits by the spirit to see if this person is of God or not. Number one, you have to, you have to, you have to pay attention to see if this person has a constitution or if this person can reciprocate your love. You know, you, you, you have expressions of, and I'm not talking about, you know, sex or anything like that, but I mean, you say to a person, you know, uh, I love you or thank you, I appreciate you or um, that was amazing, you know, and I mean, you just have these loving expressions and, you know, you're, you're grateful with the person and, and you're respectful and you're thoughtful and then you see a person that you you give this kind of um, this kind of human energy to, and it's almost like you're talking to I can't even say a dog because even dogs respond to affection, but it's it's almost like you're you're talking to a brick wall, you know, uh, you know it's like you you serve it, but they they don't possess the ability to serve it back. And you're, you, you've been noticing this, you know, you, you, you're, you're loving and you ex, you're expressive and you share that love. You share those loving expressions and they, they never, they never return it. And you take it personally initially and you say, well, you know, why, 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 why don't you, you know, reciprocate my love? And they're looking at you puzzled because they are, they don't have the capacity to give that back to you. Anybody that uh, you, you look at and you feel like, you know, I'm giving you certain energy, loving energy, um, and they can't return it or they don't return it, don't assume that they just don't choose to return it. Assume that they may not have the capacity to return it. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, says this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It's basically describing narcissists. Read the whole thing, you know, and it just gives you a whole list. But what you come away with is that a person that is a narcissist is too consumed with self-interest to even notice your needs or your interest. You know, when, when you say to them, I, you know, I love you or I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm grateful. You know, they feel like, okay, yeah, you supposed to say that because I'm all of that. They, they have been so intoxicated with self-interest. They don't even see you or hear you. They're only with you because they, they want something or need something from you that you possess. So when you're with a person and you feel like they can't return the energy, don't, don't ignore that. That's a massive red flag that you're probably dealing with a narcissist. Uh, number two, um, they are fundamentally programmed against relationships, not relations, but relationships, do you, know, do you know what I mean? When I say not relations, but relationships, they'll have sex with you. They'll have sex with you. They'll make babies with you, but they're not gonna have, they're not gonna, they're not going to, they're not going to develop a relationship with you. They may even marry you, but then they may have a wedding with you, but then they'll never marry you. They'll never be a spouse because they, they, they are fundamentally programmed against relationships. Um, they, they only have, 
A narcissist only has performances with an agenda because they are the ultimate hypocrite. They are actors. That's what a hypocrite is, is an actor. I don't know if I call them hypocrite though because a hypocrite is one that acts uh, one way and knows better, knows a better way. Narcissists don't even really know a better way. So let me take that back. I wouldn't call them hypocrites. They're, they are they're um, fundamentally broken, demonic and diabolical individuals. And I believe that. I believe the main reason that um, mental health professionals mostly, if not entirely, agree or believe, should I say, that a, a narcissist cannot be helped. I believe the reason um, the science of mental health is incapable of finding a solution is because I think, in fact, I know that the condition goes to a spiritual level. Yeah. And, you know, science runs out where science runs out, where the facts stop, you know, science runs out. And I think that there's a dimension where um, one has to embrace God, one has to embrace the creator, and there has to be a spiritual force that disrupts the rooting of that disorder in a person's life and um, empowers them to heal from all of their trauma and, you know, realigns or reorders the person's life. Now, so number two, we said they're fundamentally programmed against relationships. Anybody that, you know, you just can't seem to get them. You can't seem to lock them down and uh, to get them committed to the concept of a relationship with you. You had the wedding. You call yourself married, but they're still out in the street. They, they still won't open up. You still don't really know much about them. They're emotionally unavailable. They're disconnected from you, from the children, and all of this kind of thing. Well, hopefully you don't have to go that far to figure this out. You know, hopefully you can figure this out while you're in the process of getting to know this person that they are fundamentally programmed against relationships. And, and I think there are a few ways that um, off the top of my head that you can begin to kind of discern this, even in the, the dating, the, the, the data stage, getting to getting the information, getting to know the person, pay attention to um, their respect for time when it comes down to you. Pay attention to um, how much they learn about you over a period of time. If a person has been with you a month, they should have learned certain things about you. People that are given to relationship are respectful of the other person's time. They learn things that are, you know, important to the other person. Uh, they go out of their way to um, empower or to please the other person. If, if you've been with a person for, you know, a significant amount of time and you see none of the characteristics of one that has the maturity or the mindset to participate in a relationship, that's a red flag. You, you don't want to just sweep that under the rug and think, well, you know, I'll go to distance with this person and I'll address it later. I'll change them later. No, if a person has been with you a week, there are certain things they should have learned about you. You know, there are certain things that they should be doing, you know, sincerely doing to um, to inspire, to to encourage, to impress you even. Well, let's not use impress because narcissists will do things to impress you. But you ought to feel genuine energy from a person that they're learning you, they know you, they, they see you, they hear you. There it is. If a person, if you don't feel heard, seen, respected by a person, you know that this is not a person that is conditioned for relationships. You may be dealing with a narcissist. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery 
of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. They're fundamentally programmed against relationships. You know, I don't want to be crude, uh, but I'm sure all, most of you have heard it, especially if you're here in the United States of America. The, the, they used to tell us as young men, you can't turn a, a blankety blank into a housewife, right? Well, it's, why, is it, why, why can't you turn a blankety blank into a housewife? It's because a blankety blank is fundamentally conditioned against real relationship. Unless she gets some therapy and some deliverance and gets her mind right. A woman, in other words, that is prone to sleeping with everybody up and down the block, you can't take her and change her and turn her into a housewife because she's fundamentally programmed against relationships. You can't take a player out the club with the silk shirt and the gold chains and the three women hanging on his, you know, draped over his shoulders and his back and think somehow you're going to be the woman that's going to bring him home and sex him up so much that he's going to forget about all of that and he's going to be a wonderful husband. He's fundamentally programmed against relationships. You, you, but now here's, here's the kicker. We are typically on both sides, male and female. Good men are attracted to women who are typically fundamentally programmed against relationships. Not, not as much as women are programmed to want men that are fundamentally programmed against relationships. You know, but if you're fighting, you know, like I hear people make this statement all the time. I'm fighting for my, I'm fighting for my relationship. I'm fighting. And every time I see you, you're fighting for your relationship. Uh, that is not the way that's supposed to be going. You know, that is not, if you're constantly fighting for it, it, it means that the two of you must not be on the same page. Maybe you're dealing with someone who's fundamentally programmed against really having a, an authentic, sincere uh, connection to one individual. And if you're constantly having to try to prove, you know, this boy here, the Bible says, keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of her tongue. You know, you, you're given to that. You know, you, you're moved sexually and sensually by these things. But when you really get down to the core, there's no capacity within this person to really be in relationship. I hope I'm making sense here. Number three. Anybody that um, anybody that gives you the energy that you are an option that you are an option while 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 you make them your priority. You're always feeling like you're just an option, and here's even a better word, an opportunity. Just using you, just using you, you know, and you hang around for this, you know, because you, you develop this soul tie, you know, um, and, and, and what, what binds us many times to toxic people is the hope that you know, finally, I'm going to get somebody and you, you see all of this stuff that you think are are good signs in this person. And at the end of the day, you can't ignore energy, right? I don't care. I don't care how good of a person you seem to be. If your energy doesn't agree with me, you can't ignore energy. You know, ignoring energy is like somebody saying to you, OK, the mansion the 20,000 square foot mansion in the gated community is yours and you go in to possess it. But there's, there's a, a toxic gas that is spilling up. Let's say it's, it's not even coming from the pipes. Let's say it's something in the, in the, in the foundation coming from out of the ground that's coming up into the house and it's poisoning and killing anybody that stays in it too long. Well, that's kind of like, that's kind of like a great illustration of what you're doing 
when you're ignoring energy because you like the optics of a relationship. You love the way a person looks. You love the Instagram stuff. You love the idea of having someone on your arm. You love the idea, the thought of possibly getting married. Um, it's a beautiful mansion. But that gas, nobody can solve the problem of that gas, that natural gas that's just seeping up through the foundation into the house. And if I stay in here, I'm going to die. You can never ignore a person's energy. When a person is giving you the energy that you're an option, no respect for you, no consistency, you know, you're an option. You see, Jezebel, when you think about it, and you go to the Bible, Jezebel was really powerless. She used King Ahab to facilitate her wicked agenda. Ahab was her husband, the king. He was her supply of power. He was her supply of prestige. He was her supply of intimidation. Ahab was never really a priority. He was just an opportunity. For Ahab, Jezebel was the priority. For Jezebel, Ahab was just an opportunity. If you look in 1 Kings chapter 16, 31 and 32, it says, uh, and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took the wife, took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. See, Jezebel used him to bring in all of this idol worship. He was just supply. He was never, he was never a priority. He was just an opportunity. Now, uh, when you think about Jezebel, it's a big term in the church, the Jezebel spirit. You got a Jezebel spirit. Uh, the Urban Dictionary says Jezebel will do anything and will use anyone to get what she wants. She is interested in the people she's interested in purely as a status symbol and will toss them away and move on when they no longer satisfy. That's how you as a as a man, you keep you keep passing by, um, you know, great wife, wife type women for these Jezebel spirits with all of this, you know, all of that out and all of this out. And every time they get enough of your money, they leave you. You don't realize they're probably sleeping behind, sleeping with others behind your back anyway. And but when you when your money changes, they out the door. It's a, it's a Jezebel spirit. You were never a priority. You were just an option. You were just an opportunity. But you see, you got to figure these things out before. You know, if somebody's constantly, if you're dating somebody and they're constantly uh, breaking breaking the date for something else. You know, something always coming up. Well, what does that say to you? You're, you're, not, you're not the priority. You're just an option. You know, they're hanging out. You know, they, they're coming up with stuff. They're hanging out with their boys. It's supposed to be, y'all had this date planned three days ago. And now all of a sudden, their boys need them to come and do something or something. They'll do this or do that. And, or they, they need to do this. Well, anytime somebody's constantly calling you, telling you, yeah, we, we need to change. We need to break the date because... You're, you're not you're not a priority. Um, red flags. They um, watch how they watch how they manage. Watch how they manage their relationships with others, you know, with their friends, with their family. Pay attention to how. Pay attention to how people interact with their friends or their family, because a narcissist will destroy others to numb the pain of their own inner self-hatred and to maintain an ideal image. So if if you if you're interacting with this person and they can just drag for their friends, their so-called best friends. They can just drag for their family. 
Nobody is ever right. Narcissists tend to destroy others. You know, they get so angry that, you know, you, you're almost afraid they're getting ready to kill somebody. Uh, red flag. Jezebel, speaking of, Jezebel sought to murder Elijah when he destroyed her image of power and dominance. She had to bring him, she had to pull him down to build herself up. Just write down 1 Kings 19, 1 through 2. She sent all of her false prophets out against Elijah, and Elijah, by the power of God, defeated all of them. And let me just read it. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 1 and 2. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by, by tomorrow about this time. She's so angry. She's like, just like you killed my false prophets, I'm going to kill you. You have to, you have to be mindful if you're dating someone and they get so angry with their ex that they start cursing and you can see their their blood boiling. Well, you don't want to put yourself in line to participate in that kind of drama because at some point that could more than likely probably will be you in line of that kind of fire. Now, now um, also when you think about the narcissist, just some, just some, you know, just some good wisdom to keep at the front of your mind. You might be dealing with a narcissist, a person that is a constant flatterer. I mean, you just, you just, you just, you know, you're just constant with it. You mean to tell me you're just not going to take a break from it? Just constant. You just got your lips poked out and you're just kissing behind all day long like this. Come on, man. You, you, you know, nobody's that great that you just got to be just kissing behind all day long. Just, oh, you're just this and oh, you're just that. No, it sounds like you're trying to manipulate and, and manage me, you know, emotionally and psychologically by building me up to make me feel like I'm this perfect, you know, goddess or god of a woman or of a man. When a person knows exactly what to say, what do I tell you? slow down and analyze because narcissists are very, very skilled at flattery. Boy, they can tell you stuff and make you feel like, Ooh, just have your head about to pop off. You better try to ground yourself and come to yourself and look this person in the eye and understand that uh, flattery is a very dangerous tactic, even a demonic tactic. Um, they also become elusive and confusing in the conversation. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you're trying to get a specific point out of them and they just elude and they just slip out of, you know, it, it's like they got, it's like they have motor oil all over their bodies. You can't lock them down. They're, they're elusive and confusing because the narcissist is a masterful liar. And the narcissist is like an emotional chess player. He or she is always three lies ahead of the conversation. Um, just, uh, this is why I tell women that you have to ask questions because questions do what? Reveal motives. Queens ask questions that only kings can answer. Um... The narcissist has a gift. Wow, this is a big one right here. They have a gift to make you feel bad about being you. It's, it's amazing how when you're dealing with a narcissist, how they can shift the energy. You know, they can take you from being ecstatic and just uh, loving life today. You know, having one of those days where you're loving life. And they can, with a smile on their face, say something that triggers you. They know this is a trigger for you that will destroy everything you accomplished today and bring you to one of the lowest places you've ever been. They have a, they have a unique gift of making you feel bad about being you. The toxic narcissist makes his or her living on destruction destroying or deconstructing other people's self-esteem. 
They don't want you to have what they don't possess because they don't possess self-esteem. So the way they make themselves feel better is to make you feel bad. And when you're enjoying life and when you're thoroughly, especially if you're celebrating something and you're happy about something that has nothing to do with them, they have a unique gift of making you feel bad. And see, this begins to show up early on in the in the conversation between you and a person. A per, you can you can express something and a person can make a statement, or ask a question that that makes you second guess if the thing you're excited about is really that great of an accomplishment. Am I really that good? You know what I mean? Am I just am I am I um, exaggerating, you know, the significance of this? They have a unique ability to make you feel bad. Now, um, they, okay, here's another one. I'm just giving you the, giving this to you. They, they have extraordinary dreams, but they cannot really articulate a plan. They have extraordinary dreams, but they cannot articulate a plan. They have, they have all of these dreams and no, no strategy, no plan. You see no evidence of them actually even working on all of this stuff they say they are going to accomplish. They have extraordinary dreams, but no plan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. Okay, show me, show me yours. Uh, I'll get back with you on that. And all day long, they just, you know, they shopping, they they, in the, they 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 getting their hair cut, they getting their makeup done. They, you know, it's all they on the they on the internet. They 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 looking at Instagram. They making reels and they doing all of this 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 showboating stuff. But when you really look at their life, you know, like I, I was <laughs> I was talking with uh, one of my spiritual sons, and he's recently had about with what I think uh, is a male, male narcissist in business. And he was describing some of the things that have gone on, how this person has changed on him and uh, this person has done things to, you know, kind of take what was really his away from him. And so I asked him one simple question. I said, what does this person do? You know, that you call this person your partner and your friend you got this person in, in your business. What does he do? And he had to call me back and he said, you know, dad, I don't know what he does. I really, I, I know he's supposed to have retired from this, but I don't know what he does. What, what's going on here? This person has talked his or her way, his way into this man's life, painting this image, creating this subliminal persona. And weaseled himself into a position that he could manage and manipulate and take advantage of certain things. Extraordinary dreams, but no, no plan. Can't articulate a plan. And then, um, you know, you got to watch a person that needs constant recognition. I mean, everything you do, I go, oh my God. You know, if I had to, if I had to say thank you to Lisa for everything she does, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a chance to do nothing else. I wouldn't have a chance to do anything else. They, they, um, let's see. They're envious of people. And I'm shutting it down with this. They're envious of people who actually possess the life they fantasize about. So, you know, you, you, you think about, um, a man that is sound and stable and, uh, you know, king conscious, knows who he is. He's not really moved by his, his woman, you know, maybe saying Denzel looks good or Boris looks good or, you know, we, we have, I don't know who the people are. The boy from over there in London, what's his name? Yeah, y'all know who I'm talking about. Dark, dark dude, y'all know, Idris. You know, a man is well adjusted. He, he don't he don't care nothing about his woman saying that. I want to go see Denzel. He care nothing about that. I, don't, I would advise you don't say that to me too much. <laughs> I don't care anything about you saying that you you know these are attractive dudes. But when when a dude is narcissistic, 
and his woman says that, he becomes, his woman can come home and, come home and say that one of her co-workers, a man, is brilliant. He came up with this today. And dude will begin to eye him and view him as a mark, as, as uh, an enemy. You know, uh, avoid movies that he knows his, 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 his girl or his wife. Maybe she thinks the, the actor is attractive. He won't even bring the woman to see because narcissists are very envious of the people who actually possess the life they fantasize about. And in Proverbs 27 and 4, it says this, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but he who is able to stand, but who, should I say, is able to stand before envy. Envy is a, it's, it's a calling card of the narcissist. So listen, I, I just wanted to share this with you today out of my heart. Uh, and hopefully this helps you just kind of spinning off of what we recently talked about in terms of proving or testing people for your life. I think it's very important that you, you, you know, take in some of this and then listen to people who are experts in this field and um, make certain that you're not opening the door you know, for this kind of individual to come into your life because they can do much damage. May I pray for you? Father God, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice that's dealing with this or has dealt with this. And now, Father, my prayer is that you will bring about the healing that only you can bring. And there's some, dear God, that may struggle with, you know, just narcissistic uh, personality God, and maybe God in their heart, they're crying out from their spirit. They're crying out for deliverance. I believe, Father, you are the only one that can actually bring deliverance. Would you, would you touch them by the Holy Spirit and, and set them free and realign their lives, God? Because your word says you, 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 you desire that none would perish, but that all would be saved. Only you can do the saving. But God, heal the hearts of every person that has been impacted or broken in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen, go to my website, rcblakes.com. Sign up for my mailing list. Check out all of my online programs. Uh, thank you, those of you that have sown into our lives. We want you to know we love you. Um, if you need counseling after one like this, you may very well need counseling. Uh, there's a link in the description for BetterHelp Counseling. If you go there, BetterHelp Counseling, if you hit the link, BetterHelp Counseling will take 10% off of the cost of the counseling for you and then make a deposit into RSC Blake's Ministries for our referring you. Um, go to Amazon, check out all of my books, and be listening because very soon we're going to be um, releasing this book relative to a biblical perspective on narcissism me my mine it's going to be awesome listen i love you i'm my time is gone i appreciate you you're on top you're going higher god has more in store for you so guess what we will see you at the top god bless you until next time We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.
winter's night The world is still in calm Snowflakes dance in silver light Like whispers in a song Through the window frosty panes A quiet glow remains Echoes of a soft refrain Where only silence reigns But in the cold and lonely dark A sound begins to play A melody that sparks the night And sweeps the cold away Oh, the sound of winter serenade A symphony so sweet Six strings of love and dreams convey where hearts and coldest be Every note a star above in the sky so deep and wide The song of winter's tender love in the night we can fly Soft and warm, playing through the quiet stars, a shelter.